Thanks for uh, coming tonight. It's uh, kind of a tough night. If you like baseball, it's going to be started pretty soon. Uh, yeah, exactly. There's a game tonight? Yes. <laughs> uh, our speaker tonight is Chris Corkman. He's a uh, retired social studies teacher. He's very good in history. Uh, he also teaches uh, kids baseball. He has his own business over there in Pennsylvania. Uh, and he's also very uh, knowledgeable about these old weapons. Uh, so we're going to have a, a little presentation by him and see how it goes. Very good, thank you. thank you. Now, in my old days of a public school teacher, I would make all you guys come up, sit in the front, but I'm not going to do that. So, the nice to see you. Uh, does everybody have a handout? Because we're going to have a test in the end here. So, there's a few other coming. What we want to do is set the groundwork, and there's going to be some um, vocabulary I'm going to use. And, Michael, is there any more of those in the back? I think yeah. I brought them up. Or so. Yes. Okay. Do you like them, sir? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So before we get started, I just wanted to mention uh, some basic terms that we're going to talk about. And um, I'm going to keep it very, very basic. If you have any questions or would like me to go into more detail on anything, feel free to. But uh, some basic terms, that first one, flintlock, and that basically is a firearm that has a piece of flint in its hammer. The flint is what creates the spark. Basically, all guns work like a pea shooter. Or in cafeteria duty, kids would shoot a spitball through a straw. That's how every one of these weapons works. A gas is pushed against a projectile through a tight tube and the projectile goes out. And that's going to be the same principle in everything that we talk about here. The flintlock, a piece of flint is going to create the spark that's going to ignite some powder. Percussion, flintlocks weren't too good in damp weather because you couldn't create a spark. So in the late 1820s, they developed what they call a percussion cap, a little brass cap, which has the same chemicals in it that a child's roll of caps has in it with a cap gun. The smell of this going off would be the same as your little cap gun 30 years ago. And the cap would fit on top of a thing called a nipple, and that would create the spark instead of the flint having to do it. A percussion alteration is a musket that was switched over from being a flintlock to a percussion. And that's going to be a big thing as we talk about the Civil War. A musket is a firearm that has a smooth bore, like a pipe. Okay. A rifle has twists in it, like a twizzler, yeah. a piece of licorice, right? A twizzler. And, uh, <clears throat> I was telling a few people that up until my last year teaching, 07, I would bring this stuff in and have it in my class, and the kids loved it. Of course, today the state police would be hauling me out of there, and you wouldn't hear from me for a long time. So uh, a rifled musket is something that started out as a smooth bore, and they added rifling in, and a rifle musket is something that was manufactured originally with rifling in it. A carbine is a short long arm. So for example, this right here is the carbine. Shortened so you carry it in a scabbard on horseback. Buck and ball is a type of projectile. And what it is is it's a 69 caliber lead ball with some buckshot. This would be put into a paper cartridge with powder, rammed home, and this was good at close ranges. Not only did you have the sizable 
projectile, but you had kind of a shotgun effect of these balls hurtling through space. Uh, the other term is... They all come out at the same time. They all come out at the same time. And they come out like this, and it was good for short-range fighting, and which is going to be a topic we're going to discuss because in history, many uh, military scientists have talked about how the mini ball changed the war, and it really didn't. They said the mini ball was accurate up to 400 yards, and it was. But the Civil War soldier couldn't see that far. He had no training, no sh shooting training on technique or anything, so he couldn't figure out how to use the long range sights and the trajectory of the bullet. So most fighting in the Civil War was done at 117 yards away. And the way they got that number is they looked at field reports from all these officers, and that was about the average distance. The average distance 87 yards, about 117 yards. So the theory that the mini ball hit guys 400 yards away is overblown. It did hit some at that range, but most soldiers were not trained. Most Civil War soldiers, at least the first three years of the war, hadn't even fought, shot their musket until they got into battle. And uh, there are muskets that were uncovered in Gettysburg that would have eight balls ran down them because those poor guys were so nervous they couldn't remember if they loaded or not and they would just keep so they had no rifle musket training pretty much whatsoever so so that's a mini ball and that's a drop mini ball somewhere in the area of Gettysburg believe it or not a muzzle loader is a firearm that's loaded from the top of the barrel which is the muzzle and a breech loader like our sharps carbine is loaded from the breech. As we move forward in firearm history, the firearms go from being loaded here to loaded here. We'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. And bayonets. This is a triangular bayonet, which fits on most of these muskets. And they also developed what's called a sword bayonet, which is kind of like a sword, but also a bayonet as well. And a lot of times, these were, something like this was put on a smaller firearm like this, and sometimes issued to soldiers that were protecting artillery uh, battalions and so forth. And sometimes even this was used to cut down grass so they could move the cannons into place and so forth. Okay, so that is our little review before we start, okay? And I divided up uh, what we're going to talk about today into a couple different kind of units. And we talk about Civil War firearms, really the birth of what we know about firearms takes place around 1795. We had been independent from Britain for a number of years now. We had our new constitution. Washington was our president. And we wanted to become independent of European countries, especially the French. And the French supplied us with many muskets during the Revolution. And we, as we started our own armories, we captured, we copied, I should say, French weapons. Our two national armories began in 1795. One at Harpers Ferry, Virginia at the time, it's now West Virginia, and the other one, the Springfield Armory and Springfield Mass. Both of those sites were chosen for a reason. Harpers Ferry was going to supply the southern states with muskets for their National Guard or militia units. And has anybody been to Harpers Ferry here? It's in a place that is very inaccessible to a foreign country trying to invade us, meaning the British or the French. Springfield was chosen because the British ships couldn't get up the Connecticut River past the what? Rapids. And Field Rapids. And that's why up on the high ground in Springfield, the armory was built there. So in 1795, we started these two armories. Again, 
Harper's Ferry was to supply the southern states, Springfield, the northern states. And that brings us to the first type of gun they made, and it was a flintlock. And this is a flintlock made at the Springfield Armory. In the, uh, this is a Model 1840, but they were all quite alike. And the way a soldier would fire this would be, he would ram a, you put powder in a ball down the barrel, ram it down with a ramrod. He would then flip open the frizzing, he would put powder in the pan, flip that shut, pull back the hammer, and when the trigger was pulled, the flint hitting the frizzing creates a spark, which flips that open, the spark hits the powder in the pan, which goes through a hole into the barrel, which ignites more powder and then sends the ball out. So there's a lot going on. And the flint, every maybe five or six shots, you might have to rotate the flint sometimes. And again, if there was humidity or rainfall, this wouldn't work. You put the bayonet on the end and it was going to be hand-to-hand -hand combat. The flintlock period lasted in our country from the American Revolution right up to the beginning of the Civil War in 1861. There were thousands of flintlocks in state armories all through our country at that time. Many Confederates used flintlocks even into the second year of the war, okay? But they were obsolete. What happened was, in the late 1850s, they developed the percussion system for our muskets. And they would take a flintlock musket and they would convert it. So if this musket is here, as this started out as a flintlock, and this was made in Harpers Ferry, Virginia, and at one time it had the same device as that, the hammer with the flint, the frizzin, but what they did was they converted it to percussion, meaning they put a different hammer on it, and they screwed a nipple into the barrel, and now when it's fired, what happens is you put the powder and ball down the barrel just like in the flintlock, and you put the cap on the nipple, and you pull the trigger, and you get your spark, and away it goes. And this was a 69 caliber, and this shot that buck and ball cartridge. Now, how accurate was it? I would say this. I have shot these quite a bit. If you set up one of those old oil drums at 50 yards, and you take 10 shots, you might hit four or five times out of 10. And the reason is, is that the ball didn't fit tight in the barrel. There's little play there. So when that ball starts hurtling down the barrel, they call it balance, which means it bounces off each side, so you're going to be lucky to hit anything really accurately. And that's why they use that buck and ball cartridge where they can just throw a lot of fire out there. The other thing that made them kind of inaccurate is the ball had on it what's called a sprue. A sprue is the flat spot where you break it off the mold. Remember making plastic models? And you have that little skeleton you break your parts off of? Same thing with the ball, you get that flat spot and that hits the air and sends it all over. So that, this is what they call a percussion conversion. And this was done right at Harper's Ferry. They made it as a flintlock and then they converted it. Now with the Confederates, people say, well, where did Confederates get all their weapons from? Well, they got them from the federal government because up to January of 1861, they were receiving muskets for their state militias because of the Militia Act of 1808, which specified that the government's got to supply all the states. So again, a lot of those muskets they had were flintlocks. And when the war started, all these backwoods uh, blacksmiths started converting flintlocks to percussion. And this is one of them right here. This started out as a flintlock, and it was not converted in a modern armory. It was a backwoods blacksmith shop. You can see the vice marks on it. 
Um, the soldier who had this, Confederate soldier, you see this once in a while, lightly buffed off the U.S. Eagle off the lock plate. And U.S. is back here, he hacked a line through U.S. And that's a Confederate musket. I'm not sure where they found it, but it ended, I never saw a musket I didn't like, you know what I mean? And uh, the tip of his ramrod got hit, the back of the hammer got hit, so this was a battle-used Confederate weapon, again a percussion weapon, where the percussion cap would go right there. Now the other problem that faced the Confederates and the Union at the beginning of the Civil War is there weren't enough guns to supply all the troops. There were, they called for recruits and they got so many and they couldn't even use them all because they couldn't supply them. Two million muskets were bought from Europe. One million of them were bought from Britain alone. They had a great musket called the Model 53 Enfield Rifle, which was a really good rifle. It was used by the British in the Crimean War in the 1850s, but following the Crimean War, the British and the Europeans were looking for more modern type weapons, so they sold all their old stuff basically to us. Uh, a common European weapon is this. This is called a Potsdam musket. This was made in Germany, sold to both sides. The troops hated them. It was a huge caliber, 72 caliber, and it knocked them right on their rear ends. So whenever they could, they would throw that down and pick up something else on the field that was a little bit more modern. But this survived to tell the tale somehow. The most common Civil War musket was the model 1861 Springfield. And there were 775,000 of these made. And the Springfield Armory couldn't make all of them. So they had 15 different contractors help fill the need. And some of the contractors are, they were made in Norfolk, Connecticut, Norwich, Connecticut, who knows where Eagleville is? Yeah, by stores. By stores. And when you go through Eagleville, it takes like 10 seconds to go through. There's an old factory building there, and that's where some of these muskets were made. Uh, the Springfield Armory made the bulk of them, but again, private contractors made the rest of them. Uh, Eli Whitney made a lot of Civil War arms. I brought this one because it was made in Windsor Locks, Connecticut, by a firm called the William Muir Company, and it was made, uh, and I've talked to a few guys here before about it, if you go over the Windsor Locks Bridge, and before you go across the canal, take a right in front of the Montgomery Building, and go down about 600 yards, and there used to be some brownstone workshops there. There was a photographer in there, and a printer and all that. These were, they weren't really made there, they were assembled there. William Muir bought parts, and he assembled them there. And the price of this to the federal government was around $18. The federal government would grade them on how good they were based upon the model they got from the armory. And William Muir's guns, he had to settle for a lot less because some of the stocks he used green wood on it, and this is green wood that has shrunk and so forth. So he probably got $12 per musket. Uh, but again, this was made right in Windsor Locks, and this is the most common Civil War musket. And the guys really liked these. This took the 58 caliber mini ball. And it was a rifle, so if we put a light down the barrel, you can look down there and see the rifling. And what the mini ball did, it had a hollow base, so you can see where there's a hole in the bottom. You could ram that down kind of easy on top of powder, and when the powder ignited, it would expand the skirts of that mini ball against the rifling and send it out and they're very accurate and they, you can shoot old ones today and they're still pretty accurate. We're at 100 yards. If you took 10 shots, you could pretty much get it in that, that little, little uh, ring or whatever. Um, 
And again, that's the most common Civil War musket there is, the Model 1861. Now, how could you line up the hole in the bridge? How can you line? Line up the hole in the, in the mini ball. You didn't have to. You rammed it down. The, here's what happened. Sharpshooters that were shooting, like, has anybody ever seen the movie Gettysburg? Uh, General Reynolds was shot at Gettysburg by a Confederate sniper with a sniper rifle. And that was kind of an old target rifle that you had to hammer the ball in so it would fit tight. Okay? You couldn't use that on a regular battlefield because it took too long to do it. So the beauty of the mini ball was it went down easy because it was smaller than the barrel. But when the powder ignited in the barrel, it expanded that lead against the rifling and made it tight coming out. It didn't matter where the, the hole was in the barrel. Well, you, this just fit. When you shoot these, you could see how there's a little tolerance, but it kind of slides right in. And the other thing they did to make it slide in is, I have some of them here, but I can find one. Uh, they would lubricate the skirts of the mini ball. See those little, that yeah. little yellow stuff? That's called sheet tallow or sheet fat. And that would help that slide down and, and come out nice and tight. So, and uh, they like to say that the average Civil War soldier could get off four shots in a minute, and it's totally untrue. Maybe one in, or two at the very, very most, more like sometimes they'll say even one shot every two minutes. Because sometimes you might be laying down trying to ram that home, and then you're lining up your shot. And uh, so a lot of what's been written is really isn't true. And uh, as the Civil War progressed, there were still officers that preferred the musket shooting the buck and ball because, again, it was good at a close range. Now, we did mention Eli Whitney, and uh, this, is a, this was a very accurate rifle. It's called a U.S. Model 1841. It was also used somewhat in the Mexican War. Um, and this went through many alterations for three reasons. Number one, it wasn't fitted for a bayonet. So sometimes Colt in Hartford, under the Blue Dome, would add a little bracket on the side where you could use that sword bayonet. Because they wanted to keep the ammunition standard, this is what they call 54 caliber. They would make the barrel bigger into 58, so it would take the 58 caliber. But if it took the 58 caliber, they also had to change then the sights. So these went through a lot of alterations, and again, Colt and Hartford did a lot of them. Whitney produced about eight different types of long arms for the uh, Civil War. This one he produced it for eight years, starting in the 1840s, and he came in too low in his bid, and he never made money, even though he produced about 70,000 of these. So instead, you know how they say Whitney was the master of interchangeable parts? Have you heard that? Mm -hmm. That's another fallacy. Here's what Whitney was good at. Whitney could buy used parts from a number of different bankrupt firms and figure out ways to put them together to make a gun that was what they called good and serviceable. It wouldn't pass a federal inspector, but it might pass a state inspector. Many Connecticut troops were armed with, with Whitney uh, muskets. So the interchangeable parts really goes back to the Harper's Ferry uh, Arsenal and Springfield Armory. Now here's what happens. As we get closer to the end of the Civil War, technology is speeding up, just like with cell phones. Okay? If you buy a cell phone today, tomorrow they've got something else. That's the same thing that happened in the firearms industry. Think about this. We went 1840, we were still using flintlocks. And then toward the end of the war, we were using a breech loader, which this is, that would shoot basically a self-contained cartridge with the powder in it. You'd still put 
the percussion cap on the nipple, but it was so much easier loading it from the breech. In fact, um, has anybody ever heard of Burdan's sharpshooters? Yeah. Yes. They used Sharps rifles. This is a Sharps carbine. Very good, yes. And um, they were the first that actually trained for good shooting and so forth. Uh, this weapon here was, was um, issued to cavalry troops. And it has a little saddle ring on the back. And the way it worked was a scabbard is a holster for a rifle that you have hooked to your saddle. And some of the scabbards would go under the leg here or would be in front of the leg here. And that little ring was for the cavalryman who wore a belt and had a little snap ring that would hook onto that. So if his horse bucked, he wouldn't lose the gun off the side or whatever. So this becomes a very advanced weapon. But the most advanced weapon of the Civil War was the Spencer. And it was designed by a man named Christopher Spencer. And he was from Manchester, Connecticut. And he went to Wilbraham Academy. Imagine that. And um, so Spencer developed the Spencer rifle. And it's very modern. You would put eight bullets, regular bullets, like a semi-modern bullet. Something like this but a little shorter. No more percussion caps. The percussion cap was in the brass cartridge. Powder already measured. All those would be loaded in here. And then you pull back the hammer. That would load the shell. You would shoot it. That would eject it, almost like a modern what? Lever Action Winchester. That was kind of the forerunner. And what year was that again? This uh, was the model 1863. And they later uh, had these in carbine form, which were easy to carry on horseback. But uh, this was the most modern weapon in the Civil War, and it cut the opposition, who were the Confederates, to pieces. Now you really couldn't figure out how guys could just shoot that fast and accurately. The other thing that is quite true about firearms technology is the higher the technology, the smaller and faster the bullet goes. So in our little evolution here, we started out with that big 69 caliber ball, and now we're into a 52 caliber bullet with a little bit of a nose on it. And of course, when we get to the Vietnam War, the M16 used what caliber? 22. 22. Fast, but the bullet moved faster. So that was the whole evolution. Now, by the end of the Civil War, every single gun here was obsolete. Within a five-year period, everything was obsolete. And uh, what happened was, first of all, Most of the Springfields like this were now converted to use something called a firing pin. They would cut the barrel and make it a, what loads from here? Reach loader. And they would use a cartridge like I just had in my hand. This is a 50 caliber cartridge. Okay. And you could load it faster. There was no measuring. In Europe, where they did all the scientific uh, testing, they called their guns needle guns. The needle was the firing pin. So most of these were converted to what they call the Springfield trap door, and there's some hanging on the stairwell. Okay? The rest of these were bought up by sometimes private citizens, but mainly by a company called Francis Bannermans and Sons, which was in New York City. They bought up hundreds of thousands of Civil War weapons of all kinds. And if you own some Civil War weapons, there's a good chance that your gun passed from the Union Army to Bannermans to somebody in between you. They bought surplus weapons. Just like today, sometimes in a gun magazine, you'll see like Turkish Mausers for sale and stuff like that. 
The same thing uh, with Civil War muskets. So a lot of them were sold for surplus. Some were converted. Now, another fallacy is that there's been a lot of writing that all the Confederate weapons were destroyed. Not true. When Lee surrendered at Appomattox, most of those weapons were taken by the Union and the metal was shipped up to upstate New York and a lot of that metal was melted down for farm machinery. But when Johnston's army surrendered in North Carolina, most of those guys just wandered home. And they took their weapons with them and they used them for hunting or whatever. Uh, so there still is some Confederate weapons around. If you ever are going to buy a Confederate weapon though, let me tell you this, it's the most faked thing in collecting history. Because if you, if you have a weapon that's supposedly con Confederate, it's worth two times the value of a Union. So if somebody's going to sell you a Confederate musket, the red flags go up. Study hard before you would make a purchase on that. Okay, <clears throat> so in closing, geez, I got through that pretty fast. If I was teaching high school right now, I'd say, what am I going to do for the next 20 minutes? These guys are going to tie me up to the back door. Is there any questions I can answer anybody? Yes. Okay, when we went to the, um, the mini ball, yes. they were all rifles at that time? All rifles at that time. Okay. And uh, some of the rifles were, they would take a smooth bore and rifle it. So a mini ball could be used in it. This type of conversion was called a Belgian conversion. And it was very poorly done. When they rifled these and used the mini ball, the pressure sometimes was too great. And this back of the barrel would blow out, injuring the shooter. So later, they came up with a different system called a chambered breech, where they would, they would actually make it look like what they had add in would be a, what they call a bolster. So instead of that nipple going into the top of the barrel, they'd add in a drum with that there, which would, would work a lot better. But many soldiers got injured with that Belgian conversion. And again, they would throw those guns away and pick up something better on the battlefield. And where the Confederates got their guns from, like we said, was number one, the, the arsenals that were in those states at the beginning of the Civil War. And here's the other place they, they got them. In April of 1861, they attacked Harper's Ferry and they captured the Harper's Ferry arsenal. They took all the tooling equipment and they shipped it to two places, Richmond, Virginia, and Fayetteville, North Carolina. And they made a lot of their own muskets and rifles out of those uh, places there. Uh, and again, also Europe. So. Did the Confederates get any guns from Europe, or was it just the, uh, the Union? Yes, they got as many from Europe as the Union did. Many times, the Confederate representatives would be trying to outbid the Union representatives, one of their representatives was a man named James Burton, who had been a superintendent at Harper's Ferry Arsenal working for the federal government until the Civil War began. So, yes. Was Colt doing rifles at all? Yes, Colt was very active. Uh, Colt came out with what they call was a special model 1861 musket, and they made about 70,000 of them. Some went to the federal government and some went to the state of New Jersey. They also altered U.S. model 1841 muskets, uh, rifles I should say, by putting a long range sight on them, boring them out to 58 caliber, and adding a lug on the side for a, a sword man. Now, was Colt also doing pistols at the same time? They were doing, their money maker was the Colt Army and Navy pistols, yes. Where did the Schneider fit in this book? Now, Schneider uh, came up with a breech loading system for the British Model 53 musket rifle. So, his arms supplied the British Empire along with Canada. 
And that Snyder system came about 1864 and on. But that was one of the first breech loading systems. And when we developed breech loading systems on our own, we took a look at that system before they settled on the trap door. We settled on the trap door because it was a design of somebody working our own armory too. Yeah. So yes. Yes. Did the armory make all of its parts or did they subcontract some of them? Things were subcontracted uh, where this the, about, the first about Pratt and Whitney made ramrods. Okay. Uh, there were some people that just made the barrels. Um, this is prior to the Civil War that I'm talking about now. Well, prior to the Civil War, uh, we had contract arms as well. Okay. The Springfield Armory and Harper's Ferry could only make so many. So some muskets were made by Eli Whitney, some were Pomeroy from Pittsfield, and there's about eight or nine other manufacturers that made flintlock muskets based upon the federal model. But how about um, the individual parts? Yeah. Um, prior to the Civil War, were they um, did they use subcontractors they at all for pieces? For different pieces. It could be, it could be just rifling mm -hmm. bores, it could be ramrods, it could be barrel bands, which are these things. Uh, and because we had great water power, power in New England, all these places were making stuff for the military industrial complex. Okay. So, Thank Windsor, you. Vermont being one of the major makers of all that too, so. Was there any efforts in making a, a, a <clears throat> repeating, no, not that, like a machine, machine gun kind of rifle? Well, yes, Colt had a revolving rifle. That's it, I'm just going to say. Yes, and the problem they had with that was sometimes the ignition of one cartridge ignited other ones in the cylinder. And what they found too was the more complicated a rifle got, the more it would break down in battle. So the federal government, like for example, the federal government could have bought Henry rifles, which were like, that's the precursor of the Winchester, but they cost $51. And they were afraid that the soldiers would waste ammo. So there were some units that had Henry rifles that they bought themselves. So uh, as always, the military was kind of conservative, and they really settled on that Model 1861 musket as being a basic arm that over time would, would function properly. Yes? Were most mini balls um, manufactured, or were they made by um, the soldiers at camp? They were manufactured in factories. Um, in the Revolution, a lot of, like all the town bells got melted down, but in the Civil War, they were manufactured in a factory um, and shipped to the front in, in regular boxes and so forth. So, yeah. Was the, uh, the, the trap door, was that the, you know, standard arm until the Craig came out, or was there others in between? Yes, the trap door was a standard arm until the crag came out with a Model 1892. We were so married to how the trap door looked because it had an outside hammer. They were trying to make a trap door to shoot the 3040 cartridge, believe it or not. And uh, when we get to the Spanish American War, uh, a lot of units went, were going to go to Spain, I mean, go to Cuba with the trap door. If the war had lasted long enough, a lot of trap doors would have been used there. Some were used in the Philippines, but in time, the, the crags, enough crags were made where it, was, it proved to be a pretty good rifle. However, in the Spanish-American War, when we fought against the Mauser, the crag was overmatched right away because they couldn't load that box fast enough. Yes, sir. There's another problem with the Craig in that there's a shutoff on the box. And in training, the troops were allowed to load the box, but the cutoff had to be in position. 
and they were trained to use the rifle as a single shot, open the bolt, put in their cartridge, and fire. Only when a charge happened or there was some emergency were they supposed to be allowed to put the switch and not have a repeater. And the Mauser was a repeater, but it had what they call a stripper clip. A strip of five cartridges would set in the top and push in at once and load your magazine. So you had five fast shots, five fast reloads. And our 1903 Springfield, which followed the crag, was based on the Mauser's action. And so that was a kind of a copy of the Mauser. Yes, but for so long we lagged behind military technology in Europe. So. I believe they trapped uh, over a cheap conversion, wasn't it? Well, um, here's what happened with the trapdoor conversions. The first one they made, they kept the caliber 58. Then they went to 50 caliber, 50 70. And then beginning in 1873, the trapdoor was no longer a conversion, but made from scratch with a 4570 cartridge. In fact, Custer's cavalry was issued trapdoor carbines, and that's what they took west with them. And of course, they had some trouble extracting the spent cartridges during that little bighorn. And they're able to trace how the whole battle was basically by the cartridges found on the ground. Yes. Question on the uh, Spencer. Is that a cartridge or a paper cartridge? That is a regular rimfire brass cartridge. Yes. You guys didn't see the firing pin on the side of the hammer? Yes. Uh, the firing pin. We had one of uh, holding in the chamber. See that little yeah. thing there? I was talking about the other one over there. Oh, the uh, the the sharps. The sharps. Okay. Right. Now, I'm sorry, I'm name factors. What happened with the sharps was during the Civil War, they had a. That's the paper cartridge gun. Yes, and there's a little razor blade. So when you put the cartridge in and bring this up, it cuts the back of it off. So when the spark goes down, it's hitting the powder right away. At the end of the Civil War, they converted these to a firing pin gun, and they used the 5070 cartridge. Dances with Wolves. Costner has the, the coffee grinder sharps that would shoot the brass cartridge. How long a time period did they use the uh, paper cartridge? The paper cartridges were actually used from, the British and French used them from the, before the French and Indian War, okay. and we used them right up through the Civil War. So that, what it was was you had to have good teeth, you had to tear off the end, and the powder would go in, and then the projectile, and then you'd ram even the paper down on top for a tight fit. But that was only a, did most people use that, or is that just, because where's the, where's the powder horn come in? Well, the hunter carried the powder horn. The soldier carried a cartridge box. In fact, uh, in Massachusetts history, soldiers in Massachusetts from the Revolution up to about 1840 had to have their own musket, and they called it a dual-purpose musket. Light enough to hunt with, strong enough to use in battle. And what they were required to have was the musket with a bayonet lug, so the bayonet and a bayonet, and a cartridge box that would hold 24 cartridges. And the cartridges was put in like a block of wood was inside, and they had the pre-measured paper cartridges in there. So the powder horn is more of the hunter, the Davy Crockett lore, but with regular armies, pre-measured Pre-measured cartridges. Now, would they? Um, is there again? Is that manufactured, or did they normally um, do that themselves? With regular armies manufactured. However, at the beginning of the American Revolution, like Lexington and Concord, we were measuring them out and throwing the ball in that way, where the British had everything made beforehand. And it was at that time where they put a ball plus a little bit more, or you would. Uh, some units would have the buck and ball cartridge, some would not, but uh, it was widely used. Thank you.
Was there a great deal of interest in the military in this country towards the uh, dry sea needle system? I it was very, very popular in Europe. Very popular. In Europe. The place in Europe because everybody wanted that. I think, like many times in history, we were isolationist enough where, you know, what, one thing Washington said when he left the presidency was don't get involved in foreign alliances. So I think that that we didn't really get into military technology till after the Civil War, where we felt that we had to change over to that firing pin. And then it took us a long time, 1892, to get into the bolt action as well. So yeah, and we were kind of slow to move on that, because we liked the gun to look traditional with the outside hammer. Which well, I guess we were a bunch of hunters at the time. That's right. And that's yes. why we looked at guns. Right. Exactly. Wonders, uh, right, right. Now, was was Hatcherville was that like a you know a major producer of gunpowder, or was it just one of several? Hazard powder was the some of the best powder made in our whole country. In fact, do you remember the old Enfield Inn up across the street from Enfield High School? That was one of Hazard's houses. And when Jefferson Davis was Secretary of War for the U.S. government, he would come up and meet with Hazard about ordering the finest powder. So yes, that was great powder. A lot of the stuff, like in all wars, the government buys is horse crap. Hazard powder was top notch. Yes. It was top notch, plus it was a large percentage of what they bought. You know, best. I'm not sure exactly how much they bought, but all everything I've read on Hazard Powder was supposedly they did a was lot top-notch stuff. Yes. So I have a book called The Muzzleloading Catlock Rifle, written by the nephew or son of a Civil War veteran, and there's a lot of stories how. Hazard and DuPont were nose to nose fighting for the government contracts as the largest manufacturer. And the people down south who were into the target shooting just prior to some of the festivities down there were trying to get Hazard powder because of its superior quality for target shooting. And in one of the cases, they would put a metal container of the powder inside a larger container of like pig fat. And the government inspector's border guard, so to speak, would go in with a stick and look for it, anything in there. And they made the tub big enough so that when it went in with the stick, the stick being just short enough not to hit the container. So hazard powder was probably the prime powder in the country for quality. Okay. Now, when, when did they make the transition from like, you know, <sighs> powder to, you know, this granulated stuff. The transition from black powder to smokeless. Well, no, not the, the smokeless powder, but I mean, you know, wasn't even gunpowder, you know, made and so was it grains instead of like, kind of like real small? Well, there's different, yeah. For example, there is, when you talk about black powder, there's like 2F, 3F, 4F. And I believe the higher up you go is finer powder. So they didn't make it in different grades. Uh, hunting rifles, you wanted the finest powder because you got a little better ignition and a little more accurate where it was a little easier to make the rougher stuff for the military, but there's different grades of that, yes. So, and, and, and that was previous to the Civil War when that, that system was? All the way through, yeah. yes. And uh, we still use black powder after the, after the turn of the century in 22 rifles. And that's why if you have an old Winchester 22, sometimes the barrel is, there's corrosion in there because black powder is very, very corrosive. Yes. So if you shoot a black powder musket or rifle, you really need to clean it right afterwards because the minute you stop shooting, rust sets in. And when these soldiers were shooting the muskets in battle, they could only get about 20 shots off before they would have to go to the rear and clean it. Have you ever heard that expression, it's all fouled up? 
mm -hmm. that comes from shooting the musket. The following is the unburnt powder. And the more shots you take, you get unburnt powder in there, and you can't even ram a ball down there. So that was another reason for the lubrication of the mini ball to keep the grease in the barrel to keep the burnt powder semi-soft, so you could reload for a longer period of time. Yes, and they even had usually every 20 cartridges you'd have a cartridge called a Williams Cleaner bullet which had kind of a funny disc at the back of the mini that would somehow, they felt, scrape some of the fouling out as it went out. What was it called? The Williams Cleaner Bullet. The first time I heard of that. Yes, yeah. In fact, some people used to think that the other side was shooting explosive bullets, but it was the Williams Cleaner kind of coming apart in the air. So, yes. Smokeless powder. What is the difference between black powder and smokeless, and what time period? Okay, for us, the changeover was in the 1890s. Okay, and that's partially why, with gun laws, guns made before 1898 are considered to be Absolutely. antiques, where after 1898 they're considered modern. Uh, the old way they used to talk about cartridges, for example, this bullet is called a 5070 cartridge, which means 50 caliber bullet, 70 grains of black powder. Okay? We switched over with a Krag rifle, uh, the Model 1892 Krag rifle. It had already switched over in Europe before that. And um, here's what, and the military was slow to do it because they said, you can't hide behind your smoke now. On the other end of it, when you shoot, you expose your position. But the uh, smokeless powder was cleaner to shoot. It was it was it created more force. You could you could send a smaller bullet faster. So, for example, in a Krag rifle made in 1892, the bullet would come out at over 2,000 feet per second. Okay, this shot with black powder about 850 feet per second. It's almost where like you can kind of see it go down there like that. So that smokeless powder was a big upgrade. Anything else? Okay. He's warming up right now to start the first inning. We did it. Yes. So how many Red Sox fans here? Any Cardinal fans? I was always a Stan Musial fan. But uh, I grew up being a Milwaukee Braves fan. I was telling Mr. Ellis because I grew up being a Davy Crockett kid. And my first baseball card I ever got was a 1959 Johnny Logan. And it had that screaming Mohawk Brave on there, and I was sold. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All you guys history classes, you can do the same thing at the end. <laughs> Have a good night.